Thank you for coming. Um, gosh, quite different from when I last saw you. I think about a stone and a half lighter. <laughs> well, Definitely. you do. You look very fit. I so uh, is it a relief that it's over, or was you missing it? Today is the first day for three months I've not spent the whole day in a dance studio. And wow. um, so I'm sort of aching, but I've missed it a little bit. But uh, I've lasted so much longer than I expected, and it was my time to go. So um, <laughs> on Saturday night, I was, um, I was thinking it was right for me to, um, to leave, and that's how it worked out with the judges, and so it's fine. Good. Um, you've done other big leaves in recent years. Um, <laughs> uh, one assumes this is, was a very different kind of leave. I think, um, well, the thing about going on Strictly is you know you are definitely going to leave at some point in the show unless you win. And, um, and this time I had lasted a lot longer than I expected rather than um, it coming unexpectedly. And I think um, uh, if, you, if you fight in an, an election, then you're definitely intending, expecting, wanting to, to win. Um, whereas I think with Strictly without being cliched, there, there is an element of the taking part is as important as the winning or the losing. And, um, you know, I, I set off, it was funny, in the, in the beginning of September, one of my former colleagues from Westminster said to me, um, he said, it's quite risky what you're doing. He said, it'll probably be okay. But if you get voted off in the first week, that would be really embarrassing. And I, don't, I hadn't quite occurred to me that might happen. And a, a sort of chill went through my spine as I thought, oh my gosh, I could repeat May 2015 all over again. <laughs> that would be terrible. So the only time in the, um, the whole of the show where I actually felt some nerves about, about winning one. or losing was the very first um, a week. And uh, unlike in an election, when you are fighting a general election seat, you get told by the returning officer the result two or three minutes before you go onto the stage. Where, uh, whereas in Strictly, genuinely, as you stand there live on national television in front of a much bigger audience, you don't know what's going to happen. So it is genuinely a surprise. And so um, in that sense, it's, uh, it's more, um, there's more tension and build-up uh, in Strictly than there's an election. But I don't think it, I don't think it matters as much. <laughs> Did it take you a long time from... May 2015 to recover from that? I think, um, yes, because normally in, normally in politics, you have um, kind of time to prepare. So if you're standing down as a, um, an MP, then you have um, time to prepare. If you, if you get sacked in a reshuffle unexpectedly, that can be a shock, but you're still a member of parliament. Um, in my, if you're... Uh, if you're a marginal CMP or trying to win, a really tight seat, then you know. Whereas in my case, the thing which we absolutely knew was if David Cameron won a majority, I would lose. But if it was a hung parliament as it had been after 2010, um, then, then I wouldn't. And then I think the one thing I absolutely didn't expect is the Conservatives to win a majority. Yeah. And so until that night... Until one minute to ten. Until, until one minute to ten, I had no idea. Yeah. I don't think any of us expected that. That exit poll was um, you know, one of the... I mean, there's a number of, kind of truly shocking moments you have in politics where the world really changes. A little bit like between 2 and 2.30 in the morning when the probability of Trump being president went from 20% yep. to 80%. <laughs> those sort of bang moments. And that exit poll was one of those moments. So... When you saw what happened to Hillary, did you, do you have an idea what must have been in her head when that night unravelled? Well, I think um, even if I was expecting to win my seat, I still thought there was a less than 50% chance of um, us being the government. So while I was preparing to be Chancellor of the Exchequer, it wasn't my biggest expectation. I think the, my biggest expectation was that there would be a very, very tight... Uh, unstable parliament, more mm -hmm. unstable than after 2010, and that David Cameron might be the prime minister, but not for very long. Whereas I think in the case of Hillary, she was definitely Almost expecting there. to win, and to win, um, to become the president of the United States. And that is so, so far away from my experience. I'm not sure um, that I can really imagine. I mean, I, I, I probably have an insight into the nature of political shock, but she w was that close to being the first ever woman president, and then it was taken away. And the, 
the shock and impact of that is absolutely massive beyond anything that I experienced. And so in the end, I think, no, I don't fully understand quite how that would be. Let's, let's stick with political shock. What about the Brexit vote? What, when you woke up that morning or through that night, were you really surprised? I was... Um, I think the answer to that is um, yes and no. Because somebody like Yvette, my... my partner, Yvette Cooper, the MP for Pontefract and Castleford, she knew her constituency was going to go 70, 75% for Brexit. You could see this building all the way through the, the campaign. As I say in the book, um, I think David Cameron had the wrong strategy yep. and was worried all the time about what he was doing. But I think in the end, a bit like in Scotland, I still had an assumption that in the final days, risk um, and... Um, risk aversion would tighten things up for, for, um, Remain. for Remain. And also, I think, Joe Cox was the next door um, seat for mine. I knew her very well. All of us were so shocked by what had happened. It suspended campaigning for that weekend. And I think in our minds, it changed the, the, the dynamics. And I think it didn't for the, for the voters. But I think some of us mis misread that. So if you'd said to me... Um, you know, on that evening, I thought Remain was going to win and it was going to be very tight and I didn't rule it out, uh, but, but I thought Remain would win. Yvette was more pessimistic. She went down to do um, television on the green at one in the morning and I decided not to do any media that night and I um, went to sleep for about an hour um, between like one and two, a bit like um, on the, the Trump night. And um, I had both times a very similar experience where the door banged, I heard her come in, I picked up my phone and looked at Twitter, and as you scroll down, you suddenly saw you know, the, the, the shock happening on the screen, and you think, my gosh, this is, this is like 9.59 on election night, bang, something's occurred which is not what we expected. And that was really on Brexit night, around two in the morning, Trump night, two in the morning, and um, there's a pattern. There is a big pattern. I mean, there's kind of a pattern with Strictly in that some of those judges didn't want well, you know. to stay, but the public was out there for you. The popular vote. As, um, as Len Goodman said, um, you know, you may not be the judge's favourite, but you're the people's champion. Yeah, absolutely. Which, uh, best line, <laughs> That's the best, best line. Best line of the series. But um, unfortunately, the arithmetic doesn't quite work <laughs> that way. So the way it works on Strictly is when, um, when there's 15 people in the contest, um, if you come top of the vote the judges are pretty irrelevant <laughs> because you've got so many people, so being top is just totally dominant. Whereas once you get down to, um, to six, being bottom of the leaderboard with the judges is a big, big mountain to climb. <laughs> and Judge Rinder and I were both saying to each other before the, um, the vote on Saturday night, we both knew we were fifth and sixth. And even if we came top of the public vote, it was very, very hard to reverse it given the, the algorithm, the arithmetic. So um, we sort of knew. And let's be honest, it was... Um, it was the right thing. I mean, well, I think, I think the popular the right view thing. here right is that you were better than Judge Rinder. But well, let's get back to... <laughs> don't tell Judge Rinder. <laughs> no, well, we won't, if you don't. But let's get, let's get back Well, I've still got you. Okay. If you were the Chancellor of the Exchequer now, and you were dealing with the Brexit situation, what would you do? Well, I think... Um, I what think, do you think of what Philip Hammond's doing? I think Philip Hammond has a really, really unenviable task, as the Treasury does. And I think the Prime Minister either chooses a Chancellor she's going to back or she chooses a different Chancellor. And I am very worried. Uh, I was um, pleased that Theresa May became the Prime Minister rather than Andrea Leadsom. I think that yeah, um, yeah. she's a, a hard-headed, feet-on-the-ground kind of person who up to now has been very cautious about being a leader. Once you become the Prime Minister, you have to be a, a leader. Um, when she sacked what I thought were sensible people and put David Davis and Liam Fox and Boris Johnson into the senior positions, I felt a bit worried because I thought, as a British Prime Minister, you can't stand back and let the rats and the sack fight it out. And um, I think you've got to lead. And I think the country wants to know what is Theresa May's vision and where she's going to take us. Now, my view is that we should be aiming outside the European Union for a relationship with the European Union which is quite close to where we would have been 
outside the single currency but in the European Union rather than some big lurch to some romantic notion that we could ignore our main single market trading partners and sort of somehow rebuild the Commonwealth or the 19th century view of, of Britain. I think the Treasury and Philip Hammond are absolutely clear that that is also what is economically, fiscally, in terms of incomes, what, what is needed. And when he's voiced some of these concerns, he's been really, really quite publicly criticised yeah, exactly. by cabinet colleagues in a destabilising way. And at those moments, as a prime minister, you've got to decide. In the end, you back your chancellor or you let them swing. And if you let them swing, you will go down as well as the chancellor. And I think Theresa May has, has let Philip Hammond swing a bit too much. What I want to know from Theresa May as prime minister is where's the vision, where's the leadership, and I would like then to see David Davis and Philip Hammond and Liam Fox coming behind her view. But at the moment, do we know her view? I don't think we do, and um, the people talk about Theresa May and Gordon Brown, and are they similar or different? They're both people who had a long apprenticeship and senior jobs. They're both people who are quite controlling, who are quite risk averse, who like to grip the machine. But if Gordon Brown had become Prime Minister in June, he would have been stamping his vision on the Brexit negotiation from the beginning and saying, here is my view. And I think Theresa May but could but learn a bit from not Gordon Brown. An economist, is she? Yes, but she's the Prime Minister, and the Prime Minister's got to lead, and she's got to define a view, and Brexit means Brexit is not good enough. Um, and she's got to, she's got to, uh, it's, it's, I mean, the, the problem is, I mean, it's a massively unenviable task. Yeah. And this negotiation is incredibly hard, and setting this, this up to do it in two years rather than ten is potentially impossible, but it will become harder if she isn't clear. And I personally felt at the Conservative Party conference she pandered to the right and I think that's a mistake. Now on lots of things, you know, I think free movement can't last, I've been very clear in the book that I think free mm -hmm. movement can't last, so there's some tough things to negotiate but um, I want the Prime Minister to lead a bit more. And uh, one last question, what should the current leader of the opposition be doing? <laughs> well, to be, fair, to be fair to Jeremy Corbyn, he is He's, he's hugely consistent. Yeah, he, um, I think we all agree. <laughs> he's, the, um, he's the only person, I think, in politics who still thinks that the 1983 Labour manifesto was a good manifesto. Um, in popular culture, it's talked about as the longest suicide note in history, but it advocated leaving the European Union, and Jeremy was a champion of that. And I think part of his problem is that he doesn't really believe in... He's an ambivalent. He, he is ambivalent, but, um, but I think... Um, the thing is, David Cameron's mistake was to say, I've renegotiated our relationship, the status quo is okay, vote for it. Because people said, I don't like the status quo, I want change. And I think he, in the end, he didn't, he didn't open up the need for change enough. He thought, mm -hmm. like in Scotland and in the general election, people would just trust him. But I think, on the other hand, um, uh, I don't like the... Um, all change is good position of the, the, the anti-Europeans, because I think that's very mm. foolish. And I think I'm sort of in the same position as eight out of ten Labour voters, which is that um, I don't hear Jeremy Corbyn telling me his view. And I think that, that's bad, because the opposition's got to lead um, as well. Now, I mean, I've been very cl clear about this. I think he's a nice and genuine man. I don't think authenticity is enough in politics. I think you also have to have a vision and to be professional, and I think he needs to be able to take the Labour Party to, to the country rather than criticising the country for not being where Jeremy Corbyn uh, is. Um, in my personal view, I think it would be better for politics if he chose to stand down before the election and had another leadership election, because I don't think he can, he can win an election. But on Europe, I don't think he is, I don't think he's where the median, the median voter is not a mad pro-European, but nor are they a mad anti-European. What people want is, a pragmatic future for our country which doesn't walk away from important trading relationships. And that is a position which Theresa May is refusing to define. And I think that Jeremy Corbyn finds it intellectually and politically very hard to define. And so you sort of have, I've never known a time when neither the Prime Minister or the Leader of the Opposition really are willing to take a lead on the biggest issue facing yeah. our country in our generation. And that is a very dissatisfying time. It feels as though politics is sort of letting people down. Are you going to come back to politics? I think if I was trying to come back, I would not have advised myself to spend Saturday night in front of 11 million people 
the hey. largest audience ever in Strictly history doing a Zoolander male model. model. I think that might have but been when you, when you come down on that blazing piano, I mean, that has just all the trappings of what you need. You could give it a year. I think in the end, um, you, have to, you have to understand that... Um, I think the thing I understand really well is that people want to enjoy and Saturday Night Night's important and it's about entertaining and entertaining is about impact and shock and surprise. Um, but that is not the same as leading and governing. And um, we have a president-elect of the United States who I fear yeah. thinks governing and leading is about shock and surprise and impact I and making people it. feel happening on a Saturday night. And they're not the same thing. In politics, you have to take risks. But if you're taking risks about the future of a country, they should be careful and thought through and debated and consensual as far as you can. And when I hear um, Donald Trump say, the only person who knows in my final cabinet is me, I think he's playing a game. And this is not a game. It's really, really serious. And I'm not going to make the mistake of thinking that a Saturday night piece of entertainment, where in the end, the only person whose neck and risk is on the line is me, is the same as being a political leader, where you're talking about the future of a country and the well-being of many millions of people. They're different things. And when it's about politics and government and leadership, it's not reality TV, it's the real world, it's people's lives. And I know that. I'm not totally sure Donald Trump does. Gosh, well, on that note... Um...